Hello, my friends. I'm Dennis Prager, and I welcome to the show Alex Epstein. He is founder of the Center for Industrial Progress, and he has a book out with a great title, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Uh, He's got a sucker in me because anybody who has a book that begins with the words, The Moral Case for, I call, I have on the show. I could make The Moral Case you know, for uh, firecrackers, and I will have them on. I uh, And in this case, it is so important that we have to hear what he has to say. So, Alex Epstein, welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. Hi, Dennis. Great to be here. Thank you, sir. Uh, you, uh, you make the moral case for fossil fuels, so why don't I go down the list, which you have covered so often, and therefore I, I presume have such good answers, uh let's go let's let me take it directly down the list the biggest one is fossil fuels pollute what's your answer well my answer is it's interesting that that's the first question or thing that people think of because i think the first thing if we're on the premise of morality we have to first define what we mean by morality but i'll fast forward to my own view which is maximizing uh human well-being which is not the view of, say, many environmentalists who want to minimize human That impact. is brilliant, by the way. That is a terrific response. What maximizes more good for more people, that's a, that's a good one even for secular folks on the left. How well would they, yeah, that, that would be tough for them to answer, but they don't answer it. Anyway, that's great. That's a great beginning response but let's deal with the secondary ones of it pollutes right but but, i mean even even in that context so the question of is our fossil is fossil fuel use moral is really the question of is this something that is helping us maximize human life and to look at that we even let's just take our environment leaving aside all aspects of life does using this does using fossil fuels make an environment that's better for human beings to live or an environment that's worse for human beings to live. And I think if you took anyone from 300 years ago, pre-fossil fuels, brought them to this environment and said, hey, which one is better? I can guarantee you he would say, that's not a question. Of course, today's is so much better. The water is cleaner. The air is cleaner. We're surrounded by all these amazing you know, plant resources, food resources. You know, disease has been largely eliminated. We live in an amazing environment, and yet because environmentalists have taught us that nature is perfect and all we do is mess it up, we've ignored the fact that, in fact, we're not taking a clean environment and making it dirty. Overall, we take a dirty environment and make it clean. Yeah, I I know that's your line. I didn't quite follow that, though, when I read it. What what does that mean we're taking a dirty – let's go to the pristine or supposedly, allegedly pristine past – of let's say two thousand years ago in, in North sure. America was was the water not cleaner was the air not cleaner two thousand years ago in North America than today for a human being no in neither case because the water is naturally filled with all kinds of parasites it's also naturally not very near you in a clean form and just to look at this you can look at what activists talk about with a billion people today lack clean water those aren't people who have fossil fuels who have modern energy, they're people who lack them. So they're dealing with natural water. But we are, unfortunately, using technology, we make water a lot better. Um, And then, you know, in the book, I think in in Chapter 6, I talk about even with air pollution, we only think of the outdoor air pollution caused by, you know, coal plant, say. But that's nothing compared to the indoor or local air pollution caused by people burning wood, people burning coal right next to them. And as long as you don't want to freeze to death, which humans never do, you need you need to get warmth somehow. So no, they had much worse air in terms of the health impacts of what they're inhaling in their lungs. And again, this is leaving aside the fact that, you know, they were starving all the time thanks to lack of fossil fuels or comparable technology. Yeah, it's the gift it's the greatest technological gift, arguably, that we have. I, I, when you, it says in the biographical sketch of you that you debate environmentalists. It, do you do that often? Well, 
it's the problem because they've become more reluctant to do it. I mean, well, I that's why I'm asking. I, I was shocked to read that because they never debate. So I, I was well, very. I was. That's why I'm asking you the question. I'm quite persistent about these things. So, for example, with Bill McKibben, he wrote an article in 2012 announcing what's called the divestment movement, and nobody in the industry said anything. So I, I publicly said, I'll pay you ten thousand dollars to come debate me at Duke, and that, that did the trick. Is that online? Is that on YouTube? Oh, absolutely. At youtube.com slash improve the planet. Uh, that is our YouTube page. Uh, my debate with Bill is there. My debate with Sierra Club is there. Um, All right. You, uh, this others. is very important to me. YouTube.com forward slash what? Improve the planet? Improve the planet. Okay. Th- this is something I... So I- I'm curious. How did the Duke students react to you and McGibbon? Well, you know, first of all, they were very respectful. I'm, I'm an alumni of Duke, so one of my old professors was the one who, who uh, Gary Hall was the one who, uh, you know, created the event. Um, I think that they were surprised that anyone would stand up to him and that there was even an opposing view. And that, that was really my goal. I mean, I had a lot less experience back then than I do now, but I thought, you know, if I can just stand up and say, hey, look, there's a view that deserves to be heard, that there's a moral case for using fossil fuels, even for using more fossil fuels, that'll make all the difference in the world. And, and many people have come to me afterward and said, you know, that, that watching that debate uh, was a turning point for me. Well, I would think so. Uh, uh, so wh- what year was that? That was in 2012, November 5th. Ha- all right. So uh, have you done more? And I'm only asking because I think it's so valuable that you do it and because, as I said earlier, they don't debate. Al Gore has never debated anybody. Um, yeah, so I did in the last really public one I did was with a guy named Bruce Nillis, who's the senior director of Sierra Club in 2013. That was at Stanford University. Sierra Club refused to promote the debate, though, and they certainly have refused to acknowledge it afterward, I think, someone watches the debate, they can guess why. Um, But, you know, after that, one thing that I've also done that has gotten quite a bit of attention is I go to the rallies and I engage people and I I tape it. Um, So, for example, I was at the People's Climate March and I had a a large I Love Fossil Fuels sign along with I I always wear an I Love Fossil Fuels shirt. Um, And we had a video camera and I would just talk to people. And and it's interesting, that is, again, at the same YouTube site, youtube.com slash improve the planet. But again, I think it's very important to take the moral high ground against the people who are truly opposed to development and civilization. I would like to invite anyone with any challenge on this. This is a man that says that if you care about the moral good of humanity, you have to be pro-fossil fuel. I would love to hear your challenges. 1-8-Prager-776-877-243-7776. With Alex Epstein, I'm Dennis Prager. Hello, everybody. I have the author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Yes, you heard that right. The Moral Case I think that what we have here is an example of a man announcing, like the child in that fantastic story about the emperor who is naked, but everybody is supposed to announce how beautiful his new clothes are. And then there's one kid who screams, he's naked, he's naked. The environmentalist movement is naked. And there, uh, there's a guy here who, who's announcing that in simple terms. A- and be- once you hear it, it becomes so difficult to refute. Ha- has, haven't fossil fuels made modern civilization at least technologically possible with all its good transportation and medicine and everything else that we take for granted, like you're being able to hear me right now as I broadcast from Miami, going back to L.A., being sent to New York, which goes then back to Dallas and then comes through your car or your house or your Internet. You think that would be possible without fossil fuel? What would we do it with, carrier pigeon? 
And uh, I, I obviously the latest, it's sort of the secondhand smoke of the tobacco, uh, anti-tobacco movement. The latest is uh, that uh, carbon dioxide is going to heat up the planet to worldwide cat- catastrophic levels. What do you say to that? Well, again, I, I go back to the premise of if our goal is maximizing human well-being, we need to look at all the benefits and all the risks with precision. And every word of that is important, including with precision, because if something has a climate impact where it warms, contributes to warming of 0.8 degrees over 150 years, which is in fact the measurements that they cite, that's not that much versus if you had, you know, in, for example, James Hansen claimed that between 2000 and 2010, I, I cite this in the book, that it would get four degrees warmer in a decade. You know, that would be rather alarming in terms of the... James the, Hansen the, of NASA said that? Yep. He, he actually he predicted a four degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature over 10 years? Between two and four, yeah. The, the first chapter, anyone can get at moral case for fossil fuels dot com. It's called the, the it's uh, called the secret history of fossil fuels. And part of the reason I published that is because I really want these predict. What part of what we do in the video is just not the video, excuse me, in the in the first chapter is just put these guys on record. Because if if we're listening to someone's predictions, we know that predictions are hard. We want to look at track records, and if they have a track record of getting everything exactly the opposite of what happened. They should acknowledge that, and they should identify the flaws in their thinking that led to it. And suffice it to say, they have done uh, neither. So, but I mean, anyway, to, to look at this issue, anyone who talks about climate change, so-called, in a vacuum, it's not in a vacuum. It's a potential side effect of fossil fuel use. So you have to look at what are the benefits of using fossil fuels versus not using them. What is the energy catastrophe, the life catastrophe that's guaranteed to happen? if we don't use fossil fuels? And then how do we weigh that against the climate impact? And what we find in Chapter 4 of the book, I really focus on what's the evidence about the climate impact. What we find is that the evidence is it's very mild. It's tapering off. And the real thing that we're doing with respect to the climate is making ourselves much, much safer. So I said before, we don't take a clean environment and make it dirty. We take a dirty environment and make it clean. This is doubly true for climate. The climate is naturally volatile, it's naturally variable, and it's naturally vicious. So we're not taking a safe climate and making it dangerous. We take a dangerous climate and make it far safer. And I cite the statistic that climate-related deaths, deaths from extreme heat, extreme cold, wildfires, all these things are supposedly worse. They are down 98% in the last 80 years. And last year, I believe, was a record low, 20 something thousand compared to three million in the 30s when you had one less than one third the population so who cares about the climate exxon or bill mckibben we uh, will return in a moment and again i not only invite i implore you who differ who think fossil fuels are a bane on human existence to call in one eight Prager seven seven six the book the moral case for fossil fuels it is up at dennis I am speaking with Alex Epstein, who is the author of a major new book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. I'm going to take as many challenges as I can now on the lines. We'll begin in Denver, Colorado with Matt. Matt, thank you for calling. Dennis Prager, Alex Epstein. Um, Thank you, Dennis. I just want to thank you um, as a nurse in Colorado for helping out those people in West Africa. Thank you. Um, and um, I just had a question. So um, I'm kind of on the opposing side in terms of the climate. I'm not a climate scientist, but um, based on the research that I've seen, it seems like, you know, it's not just fossil fuels, but any kind of um, increase in CO2 emissions does raise the temperature of the planet over time. It actually even started with uh, as, as the, um, how do we say this? As we turned into farming societies, the methane from the cows actually raised the temperatures a little bit, um, but also it really increased once we industrialized. So let me just, just ask you. Let me quickly. Change. Let me just make ask you a quick question, not to challenge you, just to get your. I'm curious what the way you would deal with it. Hasn't that been good? Let's say it's true. Hasn't the warming of the planet been good since wherever it got warmer, there was more. Well, 
plant life. Know. There was more work. Humans could live there. Nobody lives in Canada above the line across the U.S. border because well, it's so cold. I would actually agree that I would say it actually, it turns out the Industrial Revolution that happened in England did counteract a small ice age. We had a little bit of a mini ice age. All right, but, all right but you're the one who raised that as a problem. Anyway, let me get, the, let me get Alex here because he's the expert. Go ahead. Well, I think the answer, the core answer is really the premise of Dennis's question. So You, you mean of Matt's question? No, of your oh, oh, mine. Oh, I'm sorry. You're answering him using my name. All right, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm stealing your intellectual capital. <laughs> borrowing, borrowing. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So, basically, if we're looking at this again, I always go back to how do we think about this. We want to maximize human well-being. Fossil fuels have this enormous benefit. It would be a huge sacrifice to lose it. Is there something from CO2? And so we want to look at what's the nature of CO2. So it has a warming impact. We know that, but we also know another thing, which is that it has a greening impact, right? CO2 is plant food, and yet that's never mentioned in the discussion. And the reason why I bring that up is not some particular theory I have about the magnitude, but a theory or a a conclusion that I have about the bias of the debate, which is that we only look at negatives in fossil fuels, but not positives. And that's a hallmark of bad thinking, where you're not looking at the full context or the big picture, you're only looking at negatives out of context. You can never get a good answer doing that. So the question is, okay, we know there's there's global greening. Why don't we talk about that? And then with warming, and this is where Dennis's question comes in, why do we assume that it's bad, especially in you know, such a small amount? No society in history, until ours, has ever been against warming. Everyone always prayed for warming because warmth correlates with life. And my, my answer is what I call very controversially but accurately human racism. And let me explain that. We have a bias against our own human race. We think that things we do to nature are bad and things that other parts of nature do to nature are good. And that's why we don't realize all the amazing things we do to improve uh, our environment. So my view is let's look at everything measured objectively and how it impacts human life. Don't assume that it's good, but don't assume that it's bad. And if you look at that, you get the moral case for fossil fuels. We should be using more, not less. And the warmth is probably good. The CO2 is almost, the, the, the plant growth is almost definitely good. And the energy is so good that it swamps everything else. All things being equal, in other words, if tomorrow a magic pill could be taken and we could get energy from non-fossil fuel, at no extra cost, would you prefer that? Well, what other attributes does it have? Because That's very have good. Okay, that's fair. Attributes. All right. Uh, well, that's a very powerful question uh, because everything comes with a price and the other side doesn't acknowledge the price exactly. of, of windmills and solar panels. And why don't you review that price for a moment? Yeah, so uh, one, of, one of the concepts, I, I wrote this article yesterday, it was the most popular article I ever wrote, and it's called How Jim, Jimmy Fallon Gives the Best Argument Ever Against Solar and Wind Energy. And it's based on this point that he made years ago where someone was proposing, let's get all our energy from hazelnuts. And he joked, well, that, you know, why don't we just get them from Fabergé eggs? You know, these things cost $9 a thing. But my question to Jimmy Fallon is, well, wait, aren't hazelnuts renewable energy? They use the sun, right? And so the answer is every form of energy is a process. Every process has a product, but it also has byproducts and it has risks. And you need to look at everything there. When you look at solar and wind, it's so resource intensive to turn something dilute and intermittent into something controllable and reliable. Okay, hold on there. We'll be back in a moment. Alex Epstein's book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. I'm Dennis Prager. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here, Alex Epstein of the Center for Industrial Progress, which he has founded his new book, which is doing quite well on Amazon, I just uh, noticed, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. In fact, uh, I'm so impressed we're going to, we've invited him to do a Prager University course on this very subject. I got one really final question because of the time, and I I, I truly uh, ask callers forgiveness. I because there are so many people, obviously, who want to ask you things. In light of the good that fossil fuels, the monumental good that fossil fuels have achieved, 
and in 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 light of the ongoing good that it is doing then there's the projected bad over 40 years or whatever i understand what how do you explain the antipathy to fossil fuels yeah i think this is this is the such an important um question you know you you deal with a lot of philosophical topics on your show so i mean there's a lot that i'm going to say that will overlap and and sort of the structure of my book is to sort of introduce human life as the standard at the beginning and then in chapter nine it's really about saying hey look we looked at all the benefits we looked at all the risks in every case the benefits were huge the risks were totally overblown why is it that all these super smart people in every issue can only see negative when they talk about fossil fuels. This can't be an accident. There has to be something driving it. And the answer is they don't have the same goal. Their goal is not maximizing human well-being. Their goal is minimizing human impact. They think that nature is perfect without us, that we're really a cancer, and that we need to absolutely minimize our impact. And so in software terms, you know, we tend to think, oh, they're concerned with the bugs of fossil fuels, you know, the, the, the pollution. But really, no, they're against the feature, the feature of having energy, which allows us to impact the world around us in our favor. And that's why, you know, you really hear they're against skyscrapers, they're against development, all these things, you know, GMO, all these things go together against transforming nature because they believe that the ideal is minimizing human impact. I remember when I was 18 and I first learned this point, I'm 34 now, It just blew me away. There's a philosophy that says we should minimize our impact on nature, and yet we survive by transforming nature. That is an evil philosophy, and it's my job. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Your answer is beautiful, and it does go back philosophically. There is a doctrine that says we should control nature and not nature control us. It's called the Book of Genesis. Alex Epstein, this was enlightening, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Good luck with your book. Thanks so much, Dennis. You're very welcome. The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. I'm Dennis Prager, and I'll see you tomorrow.